So what you do is you, you turn your birthday into a single digit. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to start here with Boris and tell you your, your numerological, astrological um, number. Okay? All right. Okay. So let's see. Uh, okay. My math is so bad. Oh, my God. Okay. So, Boris, your, your astrological, numerological number is five. Just I'm going to write okay. that in the thing. And let's see. Ray's, yours is four. All right. Okay. Okay. And my, my astrological, numerological number for anybody who wants to get me a birthday present is eight. So uh, now you guys know when my birthday is. All right. So let's see what this means here. All right. So according to, uh, we're going to start with the lowest number, which is Ray, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, Ray, your birth date merely totals four. So yeah. uh, if uh, I'm going to tell you what's up with your life. Okay. So the, the, the soul spirit has come down into life anew to give itself a fine fling at intellectual ingenuities, meaning that it aspires to excel in mental pioneerings of various kinds. You're a smarty. Uh, people come into four life paths to succeed brilliantly as engineers, check, accountants, check, architects, obviously, inventors, yes, anything that expresses the activity of pioneering in the mentalities. People whose birth dates total to four are uniformly satisfied with mechanistic jobs of almost any kind (laughs) and are happiest at home and in practical pursuits contrasted to the idealistic. You really really don't ever talk about ideology. Mm -mm, Uh, Never. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you're always about, you know, wood grains and shit like that. Absolutely. Yeah, talking about hammer grips. Uh, all right, well that one's that one's spot on, obviously. So <laughs> Boris, uh, your your birth date is totaling five. So for you, uh, the soul spirit that has come into mortal life on the five vibration, hello, meaning the sum total of the digits of its birth date, has uniformly done so to perfect itself in adaptability to change and alteration. The five life path, regarded in retrospect from any age, will be noted to have contained a well-nigh continuous program of upsets and vasectitudes. That's you, <laughs> oh Boris Vasectitude. All to end and aim that soul to learn to shape itself to progressing situations is how this is written versatility and cleverness are the great lessons being sought and mastered one thing after another seems to happen to me the five life <laughs> pather will say <laughs> but this is the course he has chosen for himself and it behooves him to know it the keynote of his whole life's mission adaptability you do always say that one thing after <laughs> yeah. another seems to happen to me <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're such a five life pather, Boris. Yeah, clearly. All right. So, uh, let's so see. wait. So this math uh, does it? You know, it's good math. Is this like his version of like supreme mathematics, the five percent nation, or something? Well, one thing we're going to learn about Pelly like... today is uh, that nothing that he says is coming from him, but from spirits in higher dimensions. He's just the messenger. Of course, if that answers your mm. question. So, uh, mine, my own uh, birth date, totally Nate. Uh, the soul spirit coming to life on eight vibration as determined by his birth date, his, I'm a, I'm a boy. That's amazing. Has contracted for a career that is supposed to mean heavy responsibilities. The number eight denotes authority, power, management, material influence, control over others, and over circumstances. You guys are but pawns in my game here. Yeah. (laughs) The main life mission to itself is power to succeed. Great financiers and industrialists are found (laughs) uniformly operating the eight vibration vibration in their character analyses quite as much as their life paths if you were born on an eight day arrived at by the preceding additions as described i don't know you (laughs) are in life to perfect yourself in responsibilities toward others by supervising and directing boris and ray (laughs) it says it and you cannot be truly happy in any subservient role the mm. moral to it is, you don't mm. have to try. Oh, thank God. All right. Being subservient, mm-hmm. that is. Oh, being subservient, that is. Your natural assertiveness is all part of your ultimately to be balanced spiritual equation. Mm-hmm. Wait, so this says that you're like a financial genius, like Fuck CEO? Yeah. In our boss. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. Our boss. I'm nothing that we didn't already know, I'm sure. Yes. So uh, Fritz, famous, famous financial genius and planner. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Yes, and now accomplished numerologist. So, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> now that we know who the fuck we are, let's start the show. <laughs> All right. All right. The Empire Never Ended. I am Fritz. Uh, I'm here with Boris, also Hello. Ray. Hey. This is the whole crew. Mm-hmm. We're back here in the uh, the old underground bunker, mm-hmm. knee deep in poo water, as we like it. Oh yeah, Montenegro. So we're not Death Valley. This is a reference to the other. You guys should listen to that arc, listeners. Okay. So today, <laughs> what are we talking about, Boris? What are we talking about? Yeah. Well, we are talking about um, a strange... Is he strange? He's very strange. He's fucking weird, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if strange is adequate enough of a descriptor for him. A true uh, freak. Yeah, he is a true freak. Uh, by the name of William Dudley Pelly. Pelly! Yes, and his fancy Silver Legion. That's yeah. right. Yeah, out of all the different like color-coded fascist groups, Silver Legion is kind of stands out. It's definitely Absolutely. more flashy well, than the khaki, you know, shirts or whatever. That's right, yeah. So uh yet another Nazi group from the uh, interwar period here. Um also one of those like super important groups that, you know, we probably don't learn enough about. So we're going to fix that uh, also today. Also some somehow I think maybe overlooked when American fascism is discussed, I think. This yeah, guy really definitely. thought he was literally Hitler in the U.S. I mean, this was who he yeah. really thought <laughs> yeah. himself as. Yeah. This was usually yeah. people like think of you know post-war Nazis and the American Nazi Party and stuff like this. These people are not so much in the spotlight, I would say. Uh, no, no. Although um, I think he does, uh, he does appear. I think in Hearts of Iron Four, he does. Yes, actually, uh, quite a lot of our. Uh, characters on this arc are in Hearts of Iron 4. Um, yeah. I think uh, there's even some Coglin reference. Uh, they certainly oh, talk about Henry yeah, Ford yeah, yeah. here and there. I mean, that's in there. But whoever did that, like, basically, <laughs> whoever wrote that possible track of America for Hearts of Iron 4, I think, mm-hmm. uh, beat us mm-hmm. to the punch here on this arc. Yeah. They really knew their shit. All right. So let's let's do it. Let's get weird. Yeah. All right. All right. So, um I think I, you know this is a this is a complicated man. He's had many many different hats. He's worn many mm-hmm. hats. Um, so I think the thing to do is to start with the mystical event outside of Pasadena, mm-hmm. which um, made him into the man he he became. So before I get too much into his bio, let's just this is the important thing. This is how most people I, I guess really met William Dudley Pelly anyway. Okay. So uh, all right, so this is part one. It's called Seven Minutes in Eternity. That actually feels like an eternity. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it's from some of his writings on this event. All right. So imagine it's, it's 1928. Mm-hmm. All right. William Dudley Pelly is at that time, uh, you know, a, a f- he's doing okay. He's a writer. He's known. His short stories are in uh, the American magazine, things like that. Uh, so he's out to, like, write in the foothills of Pasadena um, with his police dog named Laska whose name, uh, I, I, depending on like which language he borrowed to name this dog, it either means love, damage, walking stick, or blowjob. So what? Depend, I'm not sure which one he meant, um, but I know which one I'm picking. So, uh, so his police, dog fucker too. <laughs> his police dog, Laska. We, <laughs> already, what is this? We're in like two minutes into this man's life. And already, he's a already, dog fucker. Yeah, the he's dog already blowing blow dogs. <laughs> this is not a good a good start for poor Pelly here. The red rocket. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, writing some short story for American Magazine, uh, he falls asleep with he says an ethnological text in his hand. He wakes up in a panic, sure he's having a heart attack, screaming, mm-hmm. "I'm dying! I'm dying!" But he doesn't die. He instead mm. drops into a cool blue space where he is attended to by a couple of handsome dudes who get oh. him to take a bath. 
He emerges from this bath fully clothed and out of this turquoise ether surrounding the porticos of this clean kind of Greco-Roman style bathhouse enters hundreds of handsome dudes and super hot ladies who in the time would have been called sheiks and shebas from what I read. So a bunch of sheiks and shebas wander in from the ether. Uh, who he realizes that he used to know all these people um, in life at some point. And just as suddenly as he dropped into this other world, he is pulled back again with with Blowjob wagging her tail peacefully on the floor <laughs> like nothing happened. Bill writes this whole experience up, gives it to his editor at American Magazine, who, despite Bill claiming in this very article that such things are v- verboten uh, in these magazines, he decide- the magazine prints it. And um, and Bill later republishes the whole thing with like updates about the current situation um, much much later, which is the version that I read. So this is the text that made William Dudley Pelly like a household name. Uh, this was a, a a well-known kind of not quite death experience, you know, um, mm-hmm. from from a person with that was in like for instance uh, the who's who of like uh, people or time or whatever the fucking magazine was doing those things at the time. Mm-hmm. Like he was known, you know, um, mm-hmm. but he he really wants people now to meet him as who he has who he is, you know. So he explains that when he was young, he grew up in poverty in a religious family that was forced to give up their spiritual path and enter the factory. And mm-hmm. Pelly finds himself as a young man cursing God for their miserable lot. Pelly is asking why he should have any faith in God anymore at all, right? I found myself created a perpetually hungry, shabbily dressed, and none too happy youngster who had to start his life labor at 14 years of age and stay with it thereafter, even to the present. He desired a higher education, and his heart longed for the finer arts, but his working-class father kept him shackled to the factory alongside him. He entered his 20s as a, quote, heretical radical Bolshevik, and manages to scrape together enough money to publish his own magazine on philosophy. He becomes a Red Triangle Man, uh, which was uh, an effort by the YMCA to spread Christian activities abroad and like give moral support to troops and stuff like that um, Mm. in the first world war where he's exposed to the horrors of these wars and he returns to find his poor philosophy paper in ruins. And just for kicks, he adds, the swarming millions of Asia had not confirmed my faith in the conventional almighty's goodness. The swarming (laughs) millions of Asia. So, in so order wait, to, uh-huh. he was a radical, heretical Bolshevik spreading that, Christianity all over the world uh, with violence. Well, yes, yes, okay. he was an impoverished uh, mm-hmm. factory worker who tried his best to become a philosopher, but mm-hmm. fate just kept handing him the shit end of the stick. Mm. Uh, so um, he says that in order to quote save his creditors from a loss, he nobly went to Hollywood and labored among the flesh pots, only to become angered and disillusioned by the way that the whole place was run. Mm-hmm. And this account of his, in seven minutes of eternity, like signals his awakening back to spiritual life. He had been away for so long, and then people from what he later describes as the fourth dimension, fourth mm-hmm. plane, reaches down and brings him to where they are. Uh, and so... Um, so what happens after this event? Well, he, he realizes he doesn't want to smoke anymore, magically. Thing, cigarettes, just uh, they just fall off of tables, and he reaches mm. for them. Um, he, his body gets all fit and manly, and like he starts looking like a, like a sheik. And, uh, and that's when also he and Blowjob began to notice that these beings from the fourth dimension were showing up at his house and communicating to him the mm. secrets of eternity. And so, uh, so that's our William Dudley Pelly. That's who he is. He's like a, an impoverished, organic intellectual from the factory who's become a conduit to ancient spirits. But here's, here's another, though. Um, here's another story I'd like to tell you about William Pelly. Okay. So uh, in that same fucking book, the editors, I think of American Magazine, it's either them or the, the actual publishers, they do one of those, you know, about the author little bits in it, right? Where they just write a biography of, 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 of William Dudley Pelly. Keep in mind, again, this is the same book. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so here's what they write about Pelly. Pelly was born in 1890 uh, to a Southern Methodist preacher. All that is true. The preacher, it's also true, 
did give up the spiritual life to go into the factory, but the reason why he did this was to go and manage his hundreds of employees that worked at the <laughs> Pelly Tissue Company in Massachusetts, <laughs> making him like the toilet paper king of like New England uh, for you know for people's you know dirty buttholes and whatnot. So Bill was the heir to this firm. And yeah. it was with this money that he starts his own magazine, this like philosophy magazine. And then he starts another magazine and then he buys a <laughs> publishing firm. Then he buys another publishing <laughs> firm and on and on. And basically what he does um, in his like early career is flip publishing houses and like printers and stuff like yeah. this. Uh, all, and he does this all the way to Hollywood, right? Um, with like a, with a stop off as a very successful reporter for the Boston Globe. So when his projects would inevitably fall apart, they often did. He's very Trumpian in his like business uh, history too. Um, he, uh-huh. he, he again like one of those guys where you're like, God, how are you rich? How did you do this? <laughs> um, so when his projects would flop, he could always go back to daddy. Well, there's your answer, um, yeah. and work yeah. as a treasurer or the general manager of the uh, the butthole paper factory. So before. Hollywood, he was indeed a red triangle man for the YMCA, but uh, it, the way he presents it, it's that like he, you know, he volunteered out of the goodness of like his somehow Bolshevik heretical Christian heart, mm-hmm. and um, uh, but in fact he was he was being paid by the Saturday Evening Post, and also like did uh, had like a great adventure that he ran for the State Department, where um, and this is from um, the Saturday Evening Post, I believe, was the. Um uh, the newspaper that was incredibly pro Mussolini later on. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, Which was one of the largest newspapers in the country. So this is also from his his bio piece in this book. Uh, he made his way three thousand six hundred miles out of Siberia in the dead of winter with two civilian employees of the International Harvester Company, carrying many of Ambassador Francis's documents out to Consul General Harris and President Wilson, along with seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars of the Harvester Company's funds, representing liquidated properties in Red Moscow. So he he was smuggling like private uh, equity out of uh, out of Moscow. Um, after the revolution where he supposedly like, witnessed the horrors of the revolution and wrote a lot about it. Yeah, uh-huh. so he's a, like a born rich guy working for the state who said that he was a proletarian heretical Bolshevik. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when he gets back, um, he does like bank on his time there. He develops a very strong readership and manages to win a couple of O. Henry's uh, awards for short stories that he writes, not just about the war, but in general. So, uh, and also like Hollywood, as much as he complained about it, it really wasn't too bad for him. I mean, like Mm. on the creative side of Hollywood, okay, it's hard to become rich there. Like you have to be a producer or something like that. But uh, I mean, he had like steady income and steady work. He wrote screenplays for like major motion pictures, some of them Mm. genuine blockbusters and became personal friends with uh, the man of a thousand faces himself, a man named Lon Chaney, uh, Mm. a silent film star and um, like makeup expert. Do you know some of the films that he wrote? I'm just curious. He was, oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about them now. Yeah. So, um, so two of his like, Lon Chaney films, I guess those are the more interesting ones because there was one like Lon Chaney was like the fucking star, like he was the guy, you know. So to have him in your films is a big deal. So, um, he had two of those one was called Shock from 1923, and one was called The Light of Faith from 1928. I took the time to watch, um, both of these actually. I, I kind of, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was the first thing I did, in fact. The first thing I did to sit down and research this was to watch one of his movies, and uh, and I and I can straight up recommend Shock, like, that's a pretty good one to watch. So Shock is uh, it's 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 kind of fun. Um, the production is incredible. Like the the special effects for the time, really great. And so it, it follows a crippled gangster who's played by Lon Chaney, who redeems himself in the care of a good Christian woman named Gertrude. So Lon accidentally buries Gertrude in the rubble of an explosion designed to save her father, who is a banker who's being extorted from this like criminal mastermind woman named Queen Anne, who is like mm. the this like white queen of Chinatown. Um, 
but Garrett, despite being like completely blown to shit and he's a, this amazing scene, is is she she's okay. She survives, she slowly starts to get better. So uh Queen Anne, based in Chinatown, like I said, musters her criminal, like oriental forces together to ruin uh Lon Chaney and Garrett and her dad and the whole the whole gang. But before she can kill Gertrude, Lon uh drops to well, he's already on his knees, honestly. He's always on the floor in this. He's getting like beat up constantly. It's really he's interesting in this. But he's on the floor and he prays to God, uh, who sends the fucking San Francisco earthquake that kills 3,000 people but saves Gert and also wipes Chinatown off the map like Sodom. Hmm. And hmm. Um, yes. So uh, and then- Chinatown f- uh, was, was kind of commonly used in um in these in films at this time like broken blossoms is like a dw griffith film from the 20s as well which is like about you know the horrors of chinatown and how like you know evil orientals will like lure um you know, white women into their like dens of sin mm-hmm. and get them addicted to opium and shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. We didn't talk in the Coglin episode about the Fu Manchu um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. figure, but uh, he comes from a series of books, one of which featured a man that was openly based on Charles Coughlin as the hero who like knew the secrets of this dastardly Oriental plan mm-hmm. to take over America and replace it with their own president. So it's 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 actually the Manchurian Candidate. It's like the first uh-huh, version uh-huh, of that, uh-huh. like ever. But it was based on Coughlin, apparently. Yeah. So the other movie, Light of Faith, um, it's less interesting, but it's got, you know, still like high quality effects and production values and all this. And it's about a nice Christian girl who falls ill. And uh, and then there's this like quest of some ragamuffin who has a crush on her to find the Holy Grail and like bring her back to life. The only really interesting thing about it, though, is this um, – it has the – first appearance as far as i know of knight galahad of the arthurian legends and galahad mm. is a central symbol for him as we go on so i think this is maybe i don't know where mm-hmm. it starts here um yeah so that's his his like highlights from hollywood uh but he of course claims that the uh the jewish producers disgusted him of so course. he goes off to new york to self-produce his own film I mean, again, this man is not hurting for cash, you know, mm-hmm, uh, but yeah. the film flops. It doesn't work out. He goes back to Hollywood and starts up the Pelly Press and the West Coaster that begins to flirt with like spiritualism mixed with like gossip and his short stories and shit like that. So and, in what year is this now? Uh, this would be, oh, we're looking at 29-ish, I think. Okay. Yeah, something okay. like that. Um, so, so yeah. All right. So, uh, so then suddenly like, as these new papers are starting to flop, that's when he goes to the foothills of Pasadena and falls into the fourth dimension, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, again, this is like a guy that's his business has always been like business, (laughs) like selling himself, also selling actual properties, uh, trying to keep afloat in this kind of end the cycle. So um, yeah. So he finds a nice new uh, hustle here. He is such a hustler. Pelly is even more of a hustler than like Coughlin in this. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's like, he's, mm-hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah. So like he said, after this mind blowing experience, you know, he's done with Hollywood with the flesh pots, except for maybe like one more hit film that was called drag. And then no mm-hmm. more. And then also no more like grubby materialism. He said, you know, that's a Bolshevik thing, except that maybe he's also going to become a business manager at an airline, uh, president <laughs> of Pelly and Eccles advertising agency. And also maybe just like one little tiny more presidency, if that's okay, at something called the brief meal corporation. And then that's all, you know, <laughs> yes. like the jerk with Steve Martin. You know that? Well, that's all I need to. I don't need one other thing. Not what I need this. Yeah. <laughs> so Pelly uh, has amassed like enough of a spiritual following after his episode in the fourth dimension to uh, kind of devote a lot more time to it. And um, and how does this? All right. So basically, what Pelly found out is that uh, the soul is a, a sort of a life particle that uh, is is uh, for all intents and purposes immortal, and uh, and basically. 
if there's a fourth dimension where people can decide whether or not they want to be reincarnated, but there's also people even above that, like fifth dimensional people, uh, who have kind of finished this cycle of reincarnation and are just there to like help out now. So hmm. Pelly finds himself communicating with these people in the fourth and fifth dimensions who he calls mentors. And, um, it's easy to forget when this becomes more of a story about like traditional Nazism mm -hmm. that he, the whole thing is and at all times and his followers know this is based on messages he gets from these mentors. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There is a fantastic UFO connection with Pelly in his later years that we're sadly not going to be able to cover this time. We're going to do a special episode on Nazis and aliens later, but, um, so we'll yes. get more Pelly then. So I'm do you think that all of his like kind of mind. Nazi political followers were at the same time followers of this kind of new agey type of stuff that he was saying or, uh, the FBI would mm -hmm. say yes. And we'll, okay. we'll, I'll, I'll give you some anecdotes about that, uh, a little bit later. So, uh, yeah. All right. So we got the mentors whispering into his ear. Um, he invents a, a word to describe this method of uh, communication, and it's clairaudient. Clairaudient. Like, not clairvoyant, mm. but clairaudient. Pelly, uh, much like Myatt and people like that, makes up an entirely new vocabulary uh, that, that I guess also marks his followers. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty characteristic of cults in general. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, so he would have these supposed like great great wise men from centuries past, uh, celebrities basically, like speak to him, and he would have his secretary transcribe a conversation. And uh, he claims, as proof that it's all real, that a quote uh, Atlantean soul from sixty five thousand years ago uh, right. spoke to him in Sanskrit, a language that he didn't know. And also that nobody from 65,000 years ago knew, but whatever. Mm, uh, yeah. And uh, so he, he writes this out and he's like, how did I, how would I have known that? You know, it's amazing. So there you go. Uh, he writes a lot of fiction books, which shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, mm. And these fiction books also a bit like, you know, these O9A and uh, extended siege culture, uh, you know, Iron March fash fanfic that we've read in the past he's also quite good at this um his fiction books are more about developing a theology though and the first uh -huh. book that that really does this is appropriately titled golden rubbish which he sells at the low low price of four times the average daily wage of a worker in that period <laughs> um so this is how the basis of his theology. Yeah? He's got a very clear target audience. Like mm -hmm. old, dumb, rich, white people really like Pelly. Like those mm -hmm. are forever going to be his like major supporters. It's kind of uh, L. Ron Hubbard, -y, huh? Very. He's been called the Nazi L. Ron Hubbard, actually, by yeah. uh, some writers. Yeah. Um, so uh, he writes this, and tell me if you don't hear my in this. Underneath golden rubbish is a deep symbolism, prophetic in its character, which only the spiritually enlightened people who are very close to an experience like my own have thus far succeeded in recognizing. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. I'm a special boy. I'm a special boy. And you know who else is special? You are <laughs> reading me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. So also out of, you know, the sheer goodness of his heart and his desire to share the wisdom of the ancients, he writes uh, 200 short stories in this period, which he sells Damn. in 24 volumes through something called Mind Incorporated for only $10 a set, which would be about 135 bucks today in that value. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, nothing, nothing shady here. Just a man from the fourth dimension wants to sell you some boxed sets. <laughs> yeah. Fuck it. It's the thirties. Who cares? We don't know shit. Uh, so, um, actually this is the twenties still. We are still in the very late twenties. I mean, this guy does so much in so little time. It's each year is like a super condensed list of hustles, you know, that he like had or lost or whatever. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, so more established spiritualists uh, in, like, the Hollywood area, etc., cetera, uh, start calling bullshit on him. Um, and there's, like, a cascade of, uh, of, of loss of support for him from the spiritualist community. And, uh, and he loses a ton of his followers. But um, Pelly 
you will see, is a truly dedicated scam artist. Like, he really does not quit. Mm-hmm. Um, there's always an angle. Uh, so, so he ends up losing himself as a response. He goes to Greenwich Village for a long time and regularly visits seances and absorbs all these trends towards what's being called at the time psychical research. So high off of his, like, second O. Henry Award, he's still winning, like, awards at this time, Pelly reappears in 1930 with a brand new hustle, which he calls Galahad Press. And there's our, there's our return of Sir Galahad. So, uh, yeah, the Holy Grail guy. Mm. Much like the... Let me just take a pause. So he's writing rush. science fiction, right? No. Mm. No, he's just writing fiction. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, no, yeah. His, short, his, like, short stories are mostly, like, social tales, really. Oh. Yeah, they have some sort of a, a moral in them. They're moral mm-hmm. tales. Um, the, and the other fiction that he writes are like like versions of his developing theology. So mm. they're, he, he openly says that. They're not hidden. He's like, the only way I can d- describe this to you is through fiction, which is all true because, you know, it's fictional. So he's right. Like, literally, none of this can be described truthfully. Yeah. So good for him. I mean, he, I mean if, he, if a guy tells you who he is, believe him, you know. Yeah. So just like... Uh, the Galahad of Arthurian legend. Um, the press of his namesake is completely devoted to psychic power research, taking dictation from ancient Atlantean spirits, etc. Mm-hmm. I think that was Galahad. I haven't read the Arthurian legends in a long time. I might be wrong, but I, I'm sure psychic research was in there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, and Pelly thought it was legit, so, you know, I trust him. So he publishes a magazine called The New Liberator in this time and inaugurates what he calls the League of Liberation. When the magazine completely fails to turn a profit, he decides to uh, make a new customer base for it, you know? So he starts to mix in something he calls Christian economics, uh, which <laughs> which is super fun. I'll describe it pretty soon. Um, uh, it's a fun word for genocide basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and also he talks a lot about civilizational struggle while stressing the importance at all times of being a hundred percent American. So, um, there's also a movement. I wonder if you guys know more about this, uh, called the I am movement that was started in the thirties. No, no. Okay. Well, this was, this is interesting. This is like the, the, so this is kind of a spiritualist movement, maybe a cult that is essentially like, Pelly's sloppy seconds. Like the people that left Pelly ended up at this I am movement. Uh, they attracted like a lot of um, people that were more interested in Pelly's spiritualism. And the I am movement uh, continues throughout its own career to like, it's really weird. It, it like mimics Pelly as Pelly comes up with some new weird spiritual thing. They do something similar, but like denazify it a bit. You know, uh, and uh, so there's a lot of like overlap always in this in this membership. And I am, I think, I think it continues to have some surviving members who are in like yeah i see that the they're like a, an ascended master kind of oriented uh, religious movement so okay. i guess it's related to theosophy in some way i guess yeah it is know. and also there's they draw from everything rosicrucians are in it everything but mm-hmm. like pelly was a, a major um catalyst to their own um mm-hmm. mumbo jumbo so uh yeah ah okay so while like i am stays away from politics as it can. Pelly like dives all in and can't get enough of it and stuff like this. And so, uh, he, for, for, I guess everybody calling him a fraud, uh, decides the best move for him to make at this point is Asheville, North Carolina, the beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Um, beautiful, beautiful place. (laughs) So, uh, shout out to Firestorm books there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Get in it. So being, uh, you know, kind of a, a enchanting university town as it is, Pelly decides to open up his own university there called Galahad University. And this is a totally non-suspicious correspondence-based um, <laughs> university that taught the foundations of Christian economics and uh, some other dumb bullshit like that. So with income kind of slowly trickling in from this new hustle of his, this very Trump University kind of thing, he Mm -hmm. begins to really focus on assembling like a fun, more marketable kind of theology, Mm -hmm. which he describes as liberation doctrine, which you should not confuse with liberation theology. They're not (laughs) the same. Mm -mm. Uh, So he prints all these, these, this liberation doctrine stuff in a new magazine called Liberation. Um, 
And uh, that's where most of, like, if you read intelligence reports or, like, um, anti-fascist activists, a lot of what they read comes from liberation as well. Uh, a, a lot of his, like, platform would eventually be built in its own, in its successor publication. So liberation, between, like, gushing over Jesus Christ and stuff like this, has really fun articles like this. Uh, these are some titles from liberation. Take your daily cues from the Great Pyramid. Uh, why you are opposed by invisible persons, and also uh, you can remember when you were born. <laughs> These are, this is the this is the <laughs> content. So in thirty two, Pelly becomes friends with a guy named Friedrich Heiss, who is, who I read is, calls himself a German socialist, right? Mm-hmm. But from what he and Pelly get into, I think what they mean is uh, Ray. Shit, help me again. Prussian socialist. Okay, I guess that's like a term that's. I think Oswald Spengler used basically yeah. to say nationalist socialism. Yes, mm-hmm. if I yeah. remember correctly, but yeah. Um, so doesn't identify as a Nazi, but rather this. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Heiss is also a spiritualist, and he gives this kind of new shine to Pelly's at that point very primitive anti-Semitism. So Galahad College suddenly begins to offer a course in quote social metaphysics. Uh, the text for which you could purchase through Galahad Press, by the way. And then in January of 33, as this university is, you know, it's, it's going okay for a hustle. It's not doing too bad. But, uh, but then uh, Hitler is elected chancellor in 33. And Pelly mm-hmm. suddenly remembers uh, a, a prophecy that one of his fourth dimensional mentors told him way back in 1929. He just remembered it now. And, uh, and this was the prophecy. When a certain young house painter comes to the head of the German people, then do you take that as your time symbol for bringing the work of the Christian militia into the open? Hmm. So, so he got his time Very symbol. specific, fourth dimension. Oh, very yeah. specific, yes. <laughs> so, uh, so, thus, the Silver Legion is born. So um, that was like the best way I could get us to the Silver Legion because like I, you're tempted to really start with the Silver Legion and the Silver Shirts because they're, yeah. you know, that's the militant Nazi movement. But like, I think you got to understand who this motherfucker is. <laughs> so, so the Silver Legion is basically an outgrowth of his like um, diploma mill Trump University <laughs> Yeah. Like scam. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, and psychic messages from mentor spirits from the fourth dimension. Yeah. So what Sweet. what year is this now when he starts? Thirty three. Like he okay. he right on like Hitler oh, okay. Hitler has a thing, then oh, yeah. like the next fucking day Pelly remembers this prophecy, and then mm-hmm. like the next day the Silver Legion is born. Uh yeah. So he moves fast. Like he's mm-hmm. this guy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and that's how he can fit like whoa, I don't know. Whoa, like 13 hustles into a single year, this guy. He's extremely mm. Uh, mm. productive. So, um, okay. So, The yeah. official name is not Silver Shirts, right? Well, it, uh, you know, there were three official names. One of them mm-hmm. was the Silver Legion, one of them was the Silver Shirts, and one of them was the Christian Patriots. Um, okay. I think people just liked Silver Shirts because it's more fun to say. And mm-hmm. also you got the khaki shirts, the brown shirts, the black shirts, you know. So these mm-hmm. are the fancy mm-hmm. Silver Shirts. Yeah. Uh, so, and when you look at these guys, a part of you does wonder, hey, do these guys think the UFOs made the pyramids? <laughs> and uh, they do, by the way. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Silver Shirts, big red L on the shirt. Uh, the L stands for like a lot of things, depending on who's talking, but usually it's like love, liberty, and legion, some some version of mm-hmm. that. Um, okay, it's so... It's a very interesting looking symbol. It looks like a, like a magazine yeah. cover or something. Like it doesn't look like a... It doesn't <laughs> yeah. look like a Everything political... Everything about Pelly's like a magazine cover. I mean, like his so hair It doesn't is look like a like political symbol. Like, you know what I mean? It's huh. not like... A, it looks like some kind of... Like something you'd see on a tote bag or something, you know? I think they look like uh, accountants from space. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they got but, like a, it's a suit and tie, mm. you know? It's not a suit. I mean, they probably are accountants pants. who want to go to space. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, so Pelly vows in this moment that he would battle in the, quote, ultimate contest for existence between Aryan mankind and Jewry. No, no two bones about it. Mm-hmm. So, two ways about it? No bones about it? Whatever. All right. So, incidentally, mm-hmm. it's around this time that the book-length version of Seven Minutes in Eternity, which I read, this is when it comes out. So, you, this is our bookend. We start with the article popping out, 
mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the 20s. And now we end in uh, 33 with the book coming out uh, at the same time as he founds his super new Hitler legion, you know. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. So that brings us to part two, which I have entitled Jesus Tells Pelly to Nazi. All right. <laughs> Honestly, I, mean, I don't even have to read the rest of it. Like, I think that's probably enough. Like, that's, <laughs> that tells you pretty much everything you need to know right there. Jesus tells Pelly to Nazi. So um, now, as we talk about the Silver Legion and their platform and their activities, I want you to just keep in mind that Pelly is like the Fuhrer. Like, he self-identifies as this. Um, he's, he's, uh, he is their Fuhrer, and he's receiving all of his tactics and ideology and informationly, clairaudiently from dead white folk from 65,000. Does, does he have a special title for himself? Like the hero? No, well, he's the chief. Or like, ah, the chief. Oh, the chief. Yeah, he's oh. the chief. Um, so, Chief Pelly. Yeah. Mm. So, thousands of people are perfectly fine with this. They just think that that's fine. Yeah. He's the unquestioned dictator. He's receiving messages directly from spirits from another dimension. I can, I can fuck with that. That's mm-hmm. good. Okay, so upper estimates suggest, and these are the upper, upper estimates, suggest that at its peak in the 30s, there was something like 75,000 silver shirts. But mm. the other big number that people uh, say is 15,000. Pelly himself says that there were 3 million members <laughs> mm-hmm. in, right. in 48 states. <laughs> so, um, yeah, something like 15,000 to maximum 75,000 would be like the total membership. And uh, unless you're Pelly, in which case it's 3 million in the whole country. Although mm-hmm. silver shirts were in something like 30, 30 odd states. Um, so they mm-hmm. had a pretty broad reach. Okay. So now Bill is also uh, like, you know, you know, he's a sneaky, he's a sneaky guy. And it, it, I, and that really like makes him hard to research, especially if you're like really rushing it for an episode, uh, <laughs> because like he's so many hustles are starting and failing at, at different times at the timeline that like uh, it's fucking hard to keep up. So I've done my best here. Um, so let's first look at like a general view. This is all very relevant to Silver Shirts. Like we're going to look first at his like money troubles because <laughs> that's going to explain a lot. All right. So um so despite all these hustles that he had going on, Pelly is nonetheless going broke by 33, and he appears to be in quite a lot of debt. Um, I think he's got, like, cash to move on. Uh, I'm pretty sure he still has property around, but mm. uh, he doesn't seem to want to pay debts, another very kind of Trumpian thing. So uh, what he does, like any warrior of Christ would do, he sells a bunch of fictitious shares in an entirely fictitious stock to uh, a ton of suckers mm-hmm. and um in North Carolina and North Carolina already really doesn't like north like doesn't like Pelly. uh they're not a fan the like the people there the state mm-hmm. they don't like him and his movement doesn't have the same traction in like its home state as it does in in other places in the u s um and there were very friendly, very, sorry, there were very few friendly faces anywhere in like the legislature or in the courts or anything like that. And so in the meantime, Pelly gets indicted for fraud for this like fake ass stock. So um, Pelly at the same time is also being sued by a Washington based printing firm for overdue printing bills. And neither hmm. Pelly nor his representatives ever show up in court in Washington either. They just, he's just constantly fucking outrunning lawsuits and stuff. So Pelly decides to incorporate the Silver Legion in Delaware at the start of 34. And he tells his underlings to burn all the files of the Galahad press and then files for bankruptcy in April to erase uh, these these debts, um, which is not a good look for him. Mm-hmm. And dissent within the Silver Shirts. Remember, he's still the ultimate Fuhrer of the Silver Shirts at this time, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Again, dodging fucking debt collectors and stuff. Doesn't look good for him. The Silver Shirts kind of have a little mini rebellion. Not all of them, but there are some splinters starting to form. There's like a power struggle beginning to develop. And, um, you know, his less fanatical followers go to the I am movement, like that keeps sucking in his, his leftovers. So Pelly does, you know, what he always does in a pinch. He goes and communes with the spirits and the mm. ghost of Ben fucking Franklin appears yes. to him to give him another prophecy. Uh, and this is what Ben Franklin says. Now, as I read this, please know this quote is requoted all the fucking time on the internet as an actual quote. And if you see it, know that it comes from a fifth dimensional ghost version of Ben Franklin, not the terrestrial one that we all know. So, uh, Ghost Ben Franklin says, 
In whatever country Jews have settled in any great numbers, they have lowered its moral tone. If you do not exclude Jews for all time, your children's children will curse you into your graves. <laughs> ben Franklin, everybody. The ghost of Ben Franklin. So, um... And if Ben Franklin's anti-Semitic ghost wasn't enough, Jesus Christ also shows up <laughs> to tell Pelly directly that all the stuff that he said about the Jews being terrible was cut from the Bible, you know? <laughs> and uh, wait for it, by, like, secret Bible Jews. So <laughs> North Carolina <laughs> Press, um, as much as they, they already don't like Pelly, but um, they love this because they think it's hilarious. Like, North Carolina really does not take Pelly seriously, to its credit. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they're constantly, like, publishing this shit and being like, here's what Pelly said today, you know? Jesus mm. Christ is telling him to be a Nazi. So, uh, yeah. All right. So, but the thing is, is, like, America is a big place, you know? And Pelly gets plenty of readership out there to keep these doors open. And despite, I guess, technically being bankrupt, he is able to drop, like, thousands of dollars in old-timey money on this old Biltmore Austin bank, which he purchases outright and converts it all into a printing press, where he starts cranking out these, like, 10-cent pamphlets entitled things like, what 50 famous men have said about Jews, and uh, a 25-cent reprint of the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, of, of course. course, has to be in, I think, every episode that's not about Italians. Mm -hmm. And um, even selling a, a, an English translation of Mein Kampf, which he, they, they translate as My Battle. Mm -hmm. So all the while, Liberation, the magazine, is being sent all across America. It appears more and more like a kind of a psychedelic Nazi platform. Um, and it becomes a psychedelic Nazi platform as it gets closer to the 1936 elections. Mm -hmm. So... You know, we know that Pelly never picked this life. Yeah, it was of course, yeah. thrust was upon chosen. him. Yes, yeah. it's it was his thrust burden upon to him carry. from the great beyond. It's his burden to carry. Exactly mm -hmm. right. And a, so, a year before announcing this presidential run against FDR for the Christian Party, that's his party. Mm -hmm. uh, he recalled a prophecy he received back in twenty eight that became known as the Iceberg Prophecy. All right, so here's the Iceberg Prophecy. Um, this is from historian, um, the guy whose name I cannot ever remember, uh, Scott Beekman. This is from Scott Beekman. After sitting on a, quote, iceberg in the midst of hostile humanity, he would wake up one morning and find that the U.S. population would follow him like sheep. And this was the prophecy given to him. So the date of this happy morning was set to be September 16th, 1936, um, I have great respect for Pelly as a prophet, by the way. He almost always sticks a date, like an actual exact mm -hmm. date mm -hmm. on something, which is, mm. I think, very ballsy. Like, because uh, it never hurts him, ever. It's amazing. <laughs> so, so uh, this is like a month before the election. So, Pelly and his legionnaires, but really mostly Pelly, hastily assemble a party platform and they begin propagandizing this platform around America. So, around that time, the American Jewish Council, the uh, the AJC, that's, if you remember, that was the one that Henry Ford thought was setting up, like, uh, you know, um, like leaders all over America to have, like, a separate Jewish government that sits on top of America, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. That's, that's, that's Henry Ford's interpretation. <laughs> Listen to the first episode of The Ark. All right, so... The American Jewish Council puts together their own intelligence um, brief on this mm -hmm. on this idiot, and they try to make sense of his platform. And um, from here, like I should tell you that if you ever want a really fun weekend, go on to archive.org and look up stuff from William Dudley Pelly. It's got like the full FBI records are up there, like lots mm. of correspondences. It's fantastic. So a lot of this comes from these like these uh, um, sometimes hilarious archives. So all right. Where are we? American Jewish Council. Yeah. Okay, so the AJC report describes the spread of the Silver Legion as being, quote, most businesslike in how they do it. Uh, like, they pay for... Okay, the Silver Legion claims to be completely self-organized, spread from word of mouth, that kind of thing. But in fact, they, they inserted lots of classified ads in newspapers for well-paid organizer positions, like, all over the country. And... Um, and, like, these people were tasked with selling memberships to to other idiots in their area who – and then they would, like, get, like, cuts of this, essentially get paid. So um, so for the honor of joining the Silver Shirts, you would have to pay a $10 fee 
along with an additional $6 for the silver uniform that they would send you with its characteristic L stitched onto the breast. And in today's mm. value, that would be something altogether of like $320. Uh, dollars, right? So if we understand that we're looking at between fifteen and seventy five thousand members who went through this process and paid this like this uh, sixteen dollars, whatever, like he's you know, I mean, he's doing okay here. This is a fucking mm-hmm. ton of money coming in. So um, the AJC, especially in the American, fucking depression too. That's in a depression, bad. yes, it's a, <laughs> yeah, really for for prices that like no worker could pay. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, like what Th- this? Okay, so. The the membership for like the highest paid worker in America would be like um, two days worth of labor, I guess, would be the mm-hmm. the base membership. Yeah, all right. That's I mean, like the like, highest paid. You know? Like with Coglin with Pelly too, it's kind of it's kind of obvious that their own like ideas of what Jews are are their own kind of projections of their own. <laughs> yeah, um, very like this bourgeois kind of businessman swindler mentality. I mean, remember, that have. F- Ford yeah. literally profited off of all sides of World War II. Yeah, you know, yes. That was the yeah. thing that he says that Jews do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, what can you do? Mm-hmm. I guess you can make a podcast about it. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the investigators here have like i ah oh, i have so much sympathy for these people this was us trying to read myat when we started to do this fucking podcast you know in the the first arc this mm-hmm. is this is the stuff that we had to go through and and it's really fun and satisfying reading that they had to go through the same thing here in the 30s mm-hmm. so basically uh they they're complaining that as they're trying to sort of decipher what the fucking Legion program is, they've got to dig through like esoteric spiritualism, made up words, just like mm. lunatic Nazi stuff that was just hard to read. And uh, <laughs> they, the investigators didn't believe that the Legionnaires themselves really understood much mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. That is like, uh-huh. it was so hard to like decipher this shit. Like, you know, yeah, we, I mean... Yeah, we get it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they powered through, and this is what they got from it. So this is their summary of the Legion program. Um, this is also, by the way, what is taught with the idea of Christian eco- economics. All right. So the nation is to be organized as one great corporation in which each citizen will be the owner of one share of common stock for which he will be guaranteed $1,000 a year as perpetual hunger insurance, UBI. Um, Mm -hmm. Negroes and Jews are to be made, quote, wards of the republic under a general... Oh, I'm sorry, general secretary. What I should have said is under a Gentile secretary of Jews and aliens in the presidential cabinet. One city in each state is to be set aside as a city of Jews who are not to be permitted to own property anywhere else. Uh, so they can only own property in that city. Mortgages and foreclosures on private property are to be made illegal forever. A course in practical civics is to be introduced in the public school system, and children are to be taught that the Jew is a menace to America. Finally, the secret ballot is to be abolished, and all elections are to be conducted by means of the postal system, and the citizen who does not vote will be punished. Uh, so hmm. it gets a little bit worse, mm-hmm. but... Um, I want to I want to give these investigators their uh their due. I mean, they did a really good job of summarizing this. It is incredibly hard to summarize. A lot of writers on Pelly have suggested that it's actually impossible to to make good summaries of Pelly's opus uh mm-hmm. because like it doesn't fucking make much sense. It really doesn't. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a lot of it, I guess. And there's so fucking much of it. Yeah, he's mm-hmm. extremely prolific as a writer. I mean, mm-hmm. beat my it by thousands of pages, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm sure. So um so these are some examples that these Jewish investigators pulled out of like them complaining about this job that they had to do. And they were like, look at this. Look what we had to read. Out of the vastness of cosmos, the psychic antennae tunes into a voice. If the word was made flesh and spake once to man, how much stronger may be its pronouncements when the handicaps of the flesh are perished? If we cannot believe this, to whom or what shall we look for authority of commitments like the following? And then there's like policy. Like they're like, please, <laughs> please, can we finish this job? Uh, another one they, they put out, which this one I'm going to tell you, spoiler alert, is from Jesus Christ. And you, oh. they, they didn't say this. I don't know why they didn't say it. But when he writes Jesus, he writes it always in this Jesus voice. And, <laughs> and this is what it sounds like. 
Ye have no way of seeing what I believe, beloved. Ye possesseth little knowledge of time-to-time developments. Ye have no means by which ye can determine without fault what men are doing, or saying, or contending. Ye are groping in a great darkness, and I enlighten you. I send you, now, not ye, just you, ministers (laughs) ministering into you. They do come to you with despatch, lo! ere they reach you to tell you that which happeneth in the manner of the fact that hath altered. (laughs) That is Jesus. He comes back all the time. He talks like this all the time. Uh, Let me me throw another Jesus at you while you were here. Throw some Jesus at you. Yeah, let's hear what he says. Jesus wrote, Jesus spoke to Pelly like, well, like into his old age, uh, he was continually quoting Jesus in like the fifties and shit. Um, go away, Jesus Christ! Fuck. <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Here's some more Jesus. <laughs> Did I not declare unto the times to which I came, I am the way, the truth, and the light? Ye do pass on to planes of thought in your consciousness, then, behold, cometh flesh again and again, until perfection sitteth upon you. Thereafter do ye rise into cycles of performings, whose glories ye wist not. Hmm. (laughs) So Jesus apparently had a whole Bible written like this that they just cut out. Uh, Yeah. Another, I don't know, while we're on it, just a couple more fun, like, random-ass quotes from Pelly. Just out of context, just completely out of context. Which, the context doesn't really matter, to tell you the truth. Uh, This is one. This business of thinking ourselves into the female's gestating fetus, is it truly a mental exercise, a performance in locality, or is it a mere shift in thought-propelled electrons? That's one. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's complete gibberish. That is complete gibberish. Yes. This is what Total gibberish. between 15 and 75,000 people were eating up uh, on a weekly basis. Yes. All right. So um, it just occurred to me, um, his Jesus voice is like incorrect too, right? I mean, so like <laughs> if he's using ye like that, which is okay, that's like a you plural in old English, but he switches to you instead of thou. So uh, Jesus, Jesus is not. I guess he didn't assume there'd be proficient. a lot of biblical scholars following him around. So I think <laughs> I think he was pretty much in the clear there. Yeah. Well, I guess it's the second language for Jesus, English. I think <laughs> that's so true. Maybe he's, yeah. I guess he's Jesus is doing a pretty good job. I guess <laughs> considering I the mean, circumstances. I don't know why he speaks in this old timey English. It's from yeah, a different era. It's not called the, ye old English. <laughs> that's what it's called. Yeah, way. ye old English. <laughs> All right. Uh, you guys want to hear uh, two solutions to the Jewish problem? Oh, can we guess? <laughs> yeah, you want to guess? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I mean, physical we removal. Some of it already, no? Uh, well, not exactly. No, that was mm-hmm. like that was the uh, that was their most democratic program, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so I'm going to guess here a little bit harsher than physical removal. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Killing them all? That's a good guess. Uh, but that is... That, no, that's barbaric. All that they want to do is sterilize them um, <laughs> ah. so that, quote, male Jews can simply be stopped from breeding successive generations of new little Israelites to keep up this racial psychopathy, which uh, Rabbi <laughs> Wise speaks so frequently and histrionically about. Present Jewish families need not be disrupted. Present young Jews and young Jewesses need not be kept from marrying. But no more Jewish babies will come from such a union. Jewish families will be childless. That's one of their solutions. Um, the hmm. second, that's actually their second solution, to be fair. That's their, like, if the first solution doesn't work solution. So, um, and also it requires, by the way, a Congress of Aryan Nations getting together to, to, make, to vote on this democratically. So it's democratic. Oh, see. So he uses the term Aryan Nations. He does. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Not capital A, capital N, but capital mm-hmm. A, lowercase n. Okay. That's interesting. The first solution to the Jewish problem is to disenfranchise the Jew, which he calls defranchising it, from what I wrote here, after the anti-Semitic riots have been stopped, and they must designate one city in each state where he can gather with his kind and dwell against further goy reprisals. Um, 
by making that specified metropolis the only city where he can own property, like what he said, the condition will be affected where the great power-loving Jews will be forced from the American scene as individuals and the small fry Yiddishes can live his life without coming in frictional contact with Gentiles. So, uh, what riots? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that's where we're going here. <laughs> All right. So, it won't surprise anybody, I think, to learn that Pelly uh, was compared to Hitler. In the public mind, the FBI took notice. He was called things like, yeah, like the little Hitler from Asheville and stuff like that. One of his lieutenants on the Eastern Seaboard, a man named William Kemp, William Kemp uh, was very open about about this Hitler thing, saying, uh, like, I have but one criticism to make of Adolf Hitler and cleaning the Jews out of Germany. He sent too many to live with us. That's what he would say. And then crowds would go, like, crowd, reportedly with volcanic applause, they would respond. Uh, so the Dyes Committee uh, puts them on this big old list of un-American activists, and uh, they present this to Herbert Hoover. Hoover's agents, from what I could see here, uh, look the whole thing over and whittle it down to, like, a handful of groups, uh, silver shirts being like the most important, I think there. And the FBI gets very busy and wouldn't you know it, they uncovered some even more stupid ass shit. So now, first of all, we know that silver shirts is headquartered in Asheville. Um, and they, but they had what they called councils of safety. And that was the nodes in this national network that allowed, um, well, Christian militias to be formed and be connected, as well as letting Pelly himself travel safely and give speeches and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So each of these was headed by a lieutenant with Field Marshal Roy Zachary uh, leading the western half of the movement from Seattle, Washington, while Pelly, you know, was on the east. And so the FBI heard some rumblings from their informants in Seattle that Zachary and his people were starting to get very serious with word of mass pogroms planned against Seattle's Jews in concert with the Black Legion and some like America First people that, that we'll talk about in a future episode. Yeah, so, so in the Col Black Legion is a, like a, a clan offshoot that was even yeah. more kind of uh, fascist, yeah, ideological. Yes, yeah. So in Colorado Springs, another agent was told by a silver shirt that they had, okay, <sighs> What is even in the 30s, the original Nazis could not get their OPSEC together. So this agent walks mm -hmm. in, a dude straight up tells him, Hey, did you know that we're planning a coup on September 16th, 1936? Uh, <laughs> and the agent wrote, like, I wasn't really sure if this guy was crazy or not, so I don't know if this is a real plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of that really happens in here. Like a lot of things are like, we don't really know how serious to take the silver shirts. We don't even know if it's like illegal for them to use second class mail. Like we, it's hard to decipher basically. Um, and so there are also signs that there was a plan to assassinate FDR and, um, you know, more details started coming out about this ultimate plan that was forming for America, which was real. It was a real plan. Mm -hmm. So when another silver shirt, like, excitedly explains to some FBI agent uh, about the iceberg prophecy that we mentioned before, um, he outlines, like, a more complete plan of action, you know. So this is it. Um, basically, a communist revolution would erupt on June 6th of 1936. Silver shirts would restore order, and Roosevelt would be assassinated or exiled due to his declaration of martial law, and either Fiorello LaGuardia or uh, another guy would take supreme executive power. LaGuardia, surprise, a secret Jew. So to finally oust LaGuardia and his Jewish conspirators, the Silver Shirts planned to distribute fake bonds to people, which could not be cashed at any banks, uh, fomenting a riot against the banks on June 15th, 1936, uh, at which point the Silver Shirts would then um, pepper America with Christ men, that's what he called them, whom with their armed militias will make order out of all the chaos and voila, the state is taken. So uh, that yeah. is extremely specific. Yeah. That is exactly what the FBI agent said. <laughs> and um, the subject assured him, don't worry, it's all been worked out to the day by transdimensional mentors, who, of course, uh, hmm. told Pelly everything back in 29. Uh, sorry. American okay. people are fucking crazy. Fucking That's idiots. <laughs> so Pelly in 20, like, this is sorry. These mentors told Pelly everything he would ever need to know uh, until March 4th, 1945, back in 29. So he has the entire future up to March 4th, 1945 mapped out. Um, <laughs> he, also knew, <laughs> he also knew when he will die. Which he did. Was 20 years after he actually died. Yes, he <laughs> missed it by quite a lot. That's true. Nostradamus himself told him 
okay. personally when he was going to die. Um, <coughs> incorrectly. Uh, but this, that's not Pelly's fault. Nostradamus fucked that one up, right? Mm. So, um, yeah, the agent's like, yeah, it's very detailed, right? Okay, so this is what the agent writes in this, like, I'm so jealous of you guys that got to read, like, the Udba archives where people seem to, like, have fun with it. FBI mm. does not have fun ever. Like, mm. they, every stereotype about them on television is correct. Um, mm-hmm. Just humorous. Well, I think they have fun, like, making up plots for themselves mm. to, like, Well, like, uh, yeah, the creative bust. department does, but these guys... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They call that outreach. <laughs> All right, so here's here's the FBI agent. Just the facts, ma'am. Along this line of thought, information is to the effect that on July 1st, 1932, at Asheville, North Carolina, much began to be heard of the spiritual revelations which Pelly received. It appears that Robert Somersville and Pelly were the reincarnation of souls who had lived thousands, if not millions, of years upon the earth. Much of their knowledge came from India. They were able to speak in an unknown language, to have their memory lifted and recall the things that had happened the last time they lived upon the earth. Mm -hmm. It seems that they lived on all parts of the earth, including the jungles of Africa, the great ancient civilizations of the East, Mexico, South America, and also with the American Indians. (laughs) All right. The agent then goes on to note... um, This appears to be a scheme promoted by them in order to obtain the confidence of the public and gain members for their organization. Like he's, yeah, he's right. (laughs) Good job, FBI agent. I think you cracked it. But I imagine like Hoover's sitting there taking notes being like, you know, do you think they'd respond to say satanic vampires? How would they feel about that? (laughs) Just off the top of my head. I don't know. All right. So uh, it wasn't hard at all, as you can see, for agents to pick up just loads of information about silver shirts. It didn't make any of it make any more sense. But they uh, they clearly spread like every other pyramid scheme spreads, which is like <clears throat> financially encouraging organizers to go and get more members, you know. So like people would just fucking walk up to you and spill the beans all the time, you know. So the one guy, just a normal dude, was working at a watch repair shop in a department store. Um in uh this was i think actually north carolina this time so uh this older lady in like a colored wig with a, a very strong german accent uh started to like hit oh on yeah him, you know it's <laughs> like older german ladies like you're so smart you are so good at fixing the watches um <laughs> she came back so she comes back the next day um just happens by with a bunch of like pelly's literature and she says like a guy could get very rich doing stuff like this, you know, and uh, tells the clerk that her organization has a plan to take over the government. <laughs> they just, just, they don't care. So this dude's like, I'm interested, sure, you know, but I want to meet your leader first. Uh, he's totally read spy novels. He's fucking down for this. This guy is so excited to like mm-hmm. have this chance to infiltrate uh, Nazis. He calls up the fucking FBI and he's like, yo, I got a lock on this like Nazis. And this agent becomes his handler who keeps writing back like, you know, this guy really wants to do this like please send an answer i don't know what their answer was sadly but uh so the 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 plan is for this guy to fly to daytona for some reason to meet pelly i guess he's there and um yeah uh so yeah also people just were sending shit to the fbi constantly there was so much literature people would just send to them like hey a nazi gave me this i think you guys should read it you know and uh yeah so one of the so best- wait, i'm a little confused about their like organizational structure it seems like it's something between um like a multi-level marketing scheme yes and a militia yes you are not confused right. at all <laughs> but the, so so are they armed yeah. Yo, well, yeah, we're, that's what we're going to do right now. So the, the FBI oh, okay. uh, found um, some more sinister shit. Of course they did, yeah. uh, especially in, like, the Western part. So there was a um, – yeah, so this is also from an FBI report. Okay. We'll, we'll say that the guy involved in this is named Mulder, Fox Mulder. So af- who would be perfect to investigate this group, by the way? It's all about mm-hmm. psychic powers and fucking aliens and shit like that. All right. So this is uh, Fox Mulder going to interview to join the Silver Shirts, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm. So um, uh, again, I can't stop thinking about the base and all the people that interviewed like the 
reporters mm-hmm. and et cetera. All right. After a brief conversation, Pelly withdrew into seclusion, and presumably, after going into a trance and being in consultation with his patron saint, decided that uh, Mulder was reliable and could be used. Thereupon, Pelly communicated with his field marshal, Roy Zachary, at some point in Ohio, Zachary requesting that Mulder be sent to Ohio to work with him immediately. Pelly offered Mulder a hundred dollars, which uh, weekly, which today would be something like uh, like almost two thousand dollars a week as a field organizer, plus fifteen percent of all the money that Mulder might collect. Uh, and he said this: "This is Pelly to Mulder. You stick with me, and I'll make you the second biggest man in the United States." Uh, apparently, Mulder reports, Pelly said this to everyone that came to interview for this position. <laughs> you stick with me, I'll make you a star, kid! You know? <laughs> he, he was said to have this, like, Hollywood kind of attitude about him. Mm-hmm. Um, so this guy is like, uh, the, the agent, Mulder, is like, sounds great, but I don't want to pay for the membership and shit. And uh, they're like, cool, um, we like you anyway. And they gave him a key on his first day to their fucking DC headquarters, right? This sure. FBI agent is is their fucking secretary now <laughs> after this. So the agent stays with them for a while. And he brought some shit to light that um, surprised a lot of people in the U.S. And so once, when Mulder was hanging out at the, uh, the D.C. field office, Field Marshal Roy Zachary comes from the West Coast. And Zachary walks right up to him and demands to know who he is. And I'm sure, like, Mulder's thinking, like, it's over, you know, for him. Uh, but Zachary starts to strongly imply that Mulder was a member of U.S. Army General George Mosley, who we've talked about, we've hinted at mm. uh, in the last episode as well. Um, he hinted that he was a member of his, quote, vigilante organization in the United States Army, which at that point no one had known about. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and it was there. Like, this man commanded a, a, a sizable battalion of people that, quote, uh, were ready to lead a Christian army in, in the United States uh, to, like, do a putsch. Um, mm. Later on, I mean, like, yeah, basically, um, one of the Silver Shirts' plans, later, they have a lot of plans, but one of them is to like figure out a way to get Mosley in power so that he can start to genocide all the Jews and like do what needs to be done and shit like that. Um, yeah. And to have like some direct relations with him? or With Mosley? Yeah. Or with Pelly? Well, here's the thing. Pelly Mosley... Mosley's interesting. He comes up a lot. Like he's like the he's like kind of the hidden darling of this '30s American fascist movement. He was there like um, he was mm. their general. You know, he was the mm. general that liked them. Uh, and you know how they are. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jerk offs. So um, Mulder uh, Mulder does join a militia group in some uh, X Files episode. I think. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. The, the the Pine Bluff variant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, and I can't wait for you to for I, I feel like the UFO episode is going to be the ultimate synthesis of like your X Files knowledge and this <laughs> show. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it'll all make sense. All Hooray. right. So, uh, so Mulder also reveals that there are regular fascist council meetings being held at Pelly's behest um, that included all sorts of other leaders, like James True, who we were also going to talk about with the America First stuff, Fritz Kuhn. And uh, these meetings were largely about like propagandizing to U.S. military personnel in particular. Yeah. So they actually have a, a, a fascist council, like a le- uh, council of fascist leaders or something like that? Like a yes, a, yes. So, a, but a Mulder, commission. Yeah. Yes, but mm. but Mulder mostly just reports them bickering over who gets to be fewer. Okay. Right. No. Like, so and Pelly's not having anybody who, else. Who all do you know? Who who is a part of the fascist commission? Um. Well, these were the main ones that this agent mentioned. A couple of them I actually didn't recognize, and I didn't bother mm-hmm. to write down. But the, the ones that stood out were like James True and Fritz Kuhn, and so uh, 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 Charles Coughlin is not. No, 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 no. I mean, will you tell us a bit more about their relations with other uh, like fascist groups or? Uh, you know, the thing is, is uh, yeah, well, yeah, the uh, the silver shirts. A lot of like future fascist groups come out of silver shirts. This is true. Uh, but at the time, Pelly. Mm -hmm the most he could really do was this. Like, the, he had his own party, even though there was, like, the union party of Coughlin. Like, he he needed to be his own movement and was not mm-hmm. really good at working with others. And the and it worked out to his advantage in the long run, kind of. He didn't get away with it anyway. But the thing is, is uh, 
because he was so shitty at this, the Germans really seemed to have a very hard time making serious inroads with him. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. even though like the FBI is like explicitly looked for that financial connection, it was always hinted at. Like people always assumed there was one. Mm-hmm. I mean, in this time, I should also add like he's uh, he purchased this like ranch from Will Rogers outside of. Uh, Los Angeles, you know, and they start to make it into this like very expensive compound and shit. Like yeah, this. the ruins of which I think are still there. Yeah, right? yeah, like the, the water tower yeah, is yeah, still yeah. there and shit. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, but like the the money going into this is making everybody believe that he's being funded by the Germans, and the FBI never finds this. And uh, mm. really, but he's making money hand over fist on like being like a experienced publisher, you know, and like flipping those businesses and stuff like that. So, from, so far, what you said, we know that. They had some contacts of coordination with the Black Legion, which is kind of a more fascist offshoot of the KKK. Yeah, and that was we, to uh, cooperate yeah. in a pogrom in Seattle. Yes, and mm-hmm. also with the the German American Bund, which is basically a Nazi party in the U.S. Yeah, and um, they were friendly, I would say. Yeah, uh, and the yeah. America First uh, party. Yes. Yeah. And, um, um, is there any relationship with the the KKK itself? Or? Not now. Uh, mm-hmm. There will be after he gets booted out of Asheville. So um, mm-hmm. uh-huh. it's it's uh, yeah we're we're gonna we're gonna get there pretty soon actually. So um, yeah. Oh, by the way, Mulder. Before we leave Mulder, he also peeks his head into what's going on at the Galahad uh, University there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, this is what he writes. So the In university fa- is still going on. Like yeah, he has a he's the like wants to be the American Fuhrer. Planning uh, coup d'etats, pogroms, and everything, but he still, still yes. has his university. Okay. Yeah, teaching Christian economics and selling volumes of things. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is what he writes. In fact, there is no college as much conducted by Pelly. He has usually no more than one student there at a time, and this student studies in the old building devoted to the purposes of the silver shirts. Pelly is the only instructor. He has written a series of 52 lectures which are to be read and digested by the student. When the Pelly when Pelly is not there, the student merely reads without supervision the 52 lectures. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so actually no. Would be. <laughs> I mean, mostly it was a correspondence course. So I assume he still like got students mm-hmm. around. Uh, but the FBI, yeah, they also get wind of a bunch of arms purchases from Silver Shirts in Washington and California uh, and other places. But they they weren't the only ones. The FBI weren't the only ones doing this work either, because Navy intelligence also gets involved, and they hmm. put out two Marines who pose as like. Um, arm smugglers like stealing weaponry from the navy you know and uh oh. one of pelly's lieutenants like bites the bait instantly because they're obviously idiots and says that they would buy their whole stock and that they were already training in washington state at this time with weapons among other places to prepare to do some you know pogroming and cooing you know so yes so eventually all of this but even more so than any of this, his financial and legal troubles uh, would end his his fascist militant career here. So, uh-huh. but but again, not before he tries to run for president. So the iceberg prophecy made him like a shoe in. Uh, he positions himself as the only man to defeat the billion dollar gang, which I am gracing Boris and Ray with now as my as my background here. Uh, the billion dollar gang. That's what that is. Okay. Yes, this is yeah, this is that. So so Pelly is going to run for president to save America from these four forces, the four horsemen of the billion dollar gang. Communism, socialism, the Jewry, and something called Franklin Steiners, which I think are supporters of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, but, it, but Ben Franklin gave ben, him the prophecies, no, That's his boy. Too. Ben Franklin's his so boy. So that's a di- yeah. yeah. Uh, he, there's this wood, kind of wood etching a uh, print that was going around as part of his propaganda that and it said like in huge letters the the billion dollar gang and it shows uh who looks to be William Pelly in the corner um like raising up raising up like a fist to his head a little bit Hitler speech style uh facing these titans um with their names written on them. One of them says communism, one of them socialism, one of them Franklin Steiners, one of them Jewry. But like communism looks like some like dark skinned, uh, I suppose like Aboriginal type, but with very savage qualities. Like he's got like a yeah, club he has like in a his club. hand, yeah, yeah, yeah. And a grimace. I don't know. How would you describe uh, socialism? Um, well, socialism is wearing Jerusalem cruisers. <laughs> um, 
He's wearing like sandals and has like a some sort of kilt type skirt and a toga. I guess kind of a Roman, kind of Roman look yeah, it's to a bit him Roman, or something yeah. Greek, Greco Roman. Franklin Steiner's looks kind of like a conquistador. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, but he's also got that um kind of centurion looking feathered thing. Going yeah, on. he has plumage going on 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 his helmet. Like the the and, jewelry one looks like a, like I don't know like a I don't know like an an Indonesian islander or something. Yeah, really. it's the jewelry one's really perplexing. Like yeah. um, it looks absolutely nothing like any kind of stereotypical um caricature of Jews that you typically see in anti-Semitic texts. He's got a nose. Drawings. Not really though. He has a fucking ponytail. He's got like a and, top knot. And, yeah. and he has like a yeah, he has like a top knot and like a spear. And, yes. And seemingly and has like a fucking shield <laughs> uh with like a big star on it that says jewelry. Ah uh, yeah, it it's, does have the Star of David on it. Yeah. Yeah. It, but it, it looks more like a it one. looks more like a sheriff star. It's it's mm. weird. Um Yeah. Well, you know the old traditional Jewish top knot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So very uh, strange image. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. So to fight this billion dollar gang, Pelly only needs a million dollars from the American people, uh, which need to come in uh, five dollar donations. That's it. Really. That's what he said. Oh, for real? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the concluding line of his presidential presidential campaign announcement is this. Christians unite. You have nothing to lose but your Jewish shackles. Uh, so now I don't know exactly what Marx would have said about that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's complicated, I guess. But we do know what Pelly says about Marx. And so during his campaign, he gets into a little spat with a congressman who claims to be like as anti-communist as the next guy. Uh, but he requests that the Legion stop sending him their literature. So Pelly, it's a very short message. It's not insulting at all. It's quite polite and it's very sympathetic. But Pelly like loses his fucking shit and writes like a multi-page article about this guy. Um, and uh, he imagines a dialogue with this man continuing for many, many pages where he writes this other guy's lines and then writes his own responses right so uh pelly asks him if uh you know can you define uh communism congressman and the imagined congressman stammers out something about sharing wealth and so pelly continues the dialogue like this carl marx who's i'm changing his voice now he's going full uh california Karl Marx, whose real name was Heinrich Mordecai, a Jew, (laughs) defined communism as a movement to utilize the downtrodden workers of the world to emancipate world Jewry from further domination by Gentiles and to put the Jews in control of the Gentile government. What do you say to that? The author of The Commune, which he writes, the author of The Commune, should have known what it was about, don't you think? And so the congressman responds, well, I never heard of Marx making such a statement. No. Well, then it goes to show how tragically unacquainted you are with the man's life and purposes. Well, how can you (laughs) prove that Marx said any such thing? By apprising you of the exact time and place where he said it and under what conditions and to whom and for what objectives. You'll agree that 90% of leaders of communism today are Jews, won't you? He He never does. He never tells him the exact time and place. Um, it is clearly <laughs> from the fourth dimension. Like, this is yes. where most of his quotes from famous people come from. Whenever he's like, oh, well, you don't know what he really said. He really said this. What he means is that he said it to him in like a dimensional thing. That's what's going on here. So, um, yeah. So anyway, this like r- ridiculously uh, anti-Semitic campaign. I mean, like it's not even worth getting into it's just like one thing after the other he's not like Coughlin. like the jews are front and center all the time no yeah. bones about it like all the way he says like the way that hitler is managing the jews is how we need to manage the jews like that's that's it so um so these his campaign is not that successful in the end he only gets on a ballot in washington state where you know also doing that kind of Kanye west strategy and uh, he only mutter- musters uh, like 1,600 votes there, losing to both the socialist and communist candidates, um, uh. who without him would have been on the bottom of the list. So Pelly's popularity just plummets 
uh, after this uh, presidential election. And membership in the Silver Legion starts to drain out into other Americanist and spiritualist groups um, and, like that are still around and doing well. So Pelly makes some crazy last-ditch effort to expand his market to the Japanese government and to Native Americans. And so the first, the Japanese government, they don't want anything to do with him because apparently um, they were... They were focused on propagandizing uh, American blacks to join yes, the yes. Japanese cause. I didn't know about that. That was news yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a very big thing. Yeah, ah, yeah, crazy. So they didn't want anything to do with Pelly because they were like, we, I mean, sorry, you're a white supremacist. That would hurt our chances here. So uh, the Native American story, though, also doesn't go well, as you might imagine. But it's way more interesting. So here's how Scott Beekman describes Pelly's like attempt to bring the Native Americans into the silver shirts. Um, the Silver Shirt Chief believed the Department of the Interior uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, so that's BIA, um, BIA, uh, had fallen under complete communist control, leading to the exploitation of Native Americans. By coming to the aid of these victims of Bolshevik New Dealers, Pelly hoped to earn their support for larger political programs. So recognizing that support for Native Americans did not mesh with his prior racial and political statements, Pelly sought religious explanations for a policy shift. He declared that Silver Shirts should reach out to Native Americans because these oppressed people were actually survivors of Atlantis. All right. The background meant that they represented, quote, purebred constitutionalists and, quote, natural-born psychics. Given their Atlantean heritage, Native Americans possess special insights into the, quote, racial conspiracy of the Jew and the secret communistic structure of the New Deal, as, you know, Atlantean psychics and all. So uh, <laughs> right. Pelly's uh, appeals did not meet a lot of success. But um, just when you thought that couldn't get fucking stupider, he would write articles directed to uh, Native Americans in a cant, in like a, a movie Native American cant that he picked up oh, from like no. watching Westerns. So he would fucking write shit. He would call himself Chief Pelly of the Silver Tribe and like oh, write in this like broken English, like me want presidency, you know, this kind of like oh, how Jesus Christ. and unbelievable, unfucking believable. <laughs> oh, fuck. But it makes so much sense when you learn, when you, you know, after his Jesus, like, of course, this is what he's going to do. <laughs> what an idiot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But there, yeah. there was a like a Native American fascist. Yes, guy, right? well, kind of. Yeah, his name mm-hmm. was Elwood Towner, mm-hmm. uh, and this guy was sort of like a clown that Nazis would hire to appear at their things to like to look like they're cool with Native Americans. Uh, this is also uh, from. Um, from Scott Beekman, uh, falsely billing himself as Chief Red Cloud of the River Rouge tribe. River Rouge. That is the name of the plant, the Ford plant in Dearborn, Michigan, just mm-hmm. so we know. Uh, Towner spoke at Silver Shirt and German American Bund meetings throughout the Pacific Northwest. Red Cloud usually dressed in swastika covered buckskins at these rallies, loudly defending Hitler while excoriating Jews, Roosevelt, and the head of uh, Indian Affairs, John Collier. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, Pelly, like this guy, uh, made paid appearances only, and uh, they were getting okay. increasingly expensive. Okay. Like he showed up at the Boone and shit, like I mentioned, uh, and it seemed like they were more willing to pay than Pelly was. So Pelly had to cut his ties and just like give up this <laughs> Native American bid. Um, and also at this time, he is convicted in North Carolina of securities fraud. So he decides that it's time to just pick up stakes now again and move to Indiana, where his secretary slash mistress slash eventual third wife was from. So there he's introduced to a man named Carl Losey. Now, mm-hmm. Carl Losey was a former state trooper and mm-hmm. a current state Klansman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they hung out a lot. And there was talk about Pelly and Losey, uh, or Lucy, I don't know, Losey, revitalizing the KKK together, bringing mm-hmm. it back to its glory. Um, but it also kind of seems like this was just like a, almost like a press stunt. Uh, it's hard to see if anything serious came from this at all. Like, uh, essentially it all turned against Pelly and like anti-fascists in Indiana started to smash up his like publishing houses and stuff. So he has to move back to North Carolina and he's, you know, forced to pay bond on this conviction he got for securities fraud. 
But the judge says, no, fuck you. I'm also going to try you for parole violations, like leaving the state, like publishing political texts when we told you you can't. And so you're going to go to prison for two to three years now. So Pelly just like yeets himself back to Indiana. So it's better with the anti-fascist, you know, breaking up his paper than it is in North Carolina with like the police coming for him. So uh, while he's setting up shop there, and by the way, finishing this like expensive fucking ranch this uh, in, outside of Los Angeles, um, with also fun note about that some of the more like expensive and difficult engineering feats developed there like it was quite a place uh the only guy they could find that was good enough to do these things at the price they were offering was a black engineer incidentally Mm. um ironies of history there but um so the sweatshirts had their own compound they do, but then Pearl Harbor happens. Okay. And like like most people in this part of the arc, that's sort of the beginning of the end. Um, yeah. So, so do uh, we know what did they do on their compound? And... Well, you, training. I mean, they said that they were training. Like, they mm-hmm. were training for, yeah, Apocalypse. For, like, the, mm-hmm. the, the giant national pogroms and stuff and the riots against the banks that they would step in to take order over. So, yeah. and one other thing I wanted to ask. So the civil civil legion, legion is called the civil shirts because they have the uniform. Obviously, does that mean also you didn't mention so much? Do they do a lot of marching around and like do they have like these big uh, like meetings with the chief giving speeches and the usual kind of fascist type? Yes, of stuff? Yes, it's a quite public thing Mm -hmm. i mean these guys Mm -hmm. it's not hard to find silver shirt pictures like Mm -hmm. they they loved press um Mm -hmm. pelly i mean that's he needs his attention this is what he lives on you know did they use the the like the nazi salute i have a picture of them sig heiling so i guess they did uh the thing is i I mean yeah definitely they did because like really pelly modeled everything he did off of hitler plus mentor spirits so like Mm -hmm. all of all of the marching the um, i don't know uh, the saluting all that yeah like if hitler did it and it was on tv or whatever newsreels he would yeah. do it yeah mm-hmm. um okay so at the start of 42 now fdr writes to hoover about an issue of a magazine that's now called the galilean so the galilean is the new liberation if you remember liberation comes from other magazines from before liberation was banned as like a nazi mag so mm-hmm. um, Galilean now is, uh, is in a publication. So um, they find an issue of this Galilean inside a soldier's duffel bag. And this becomes like a big deal. I think what it is, it's like, it's an excuse now for the state to jump in. So now there's some like tangible evidence that Pelly's crew has some sort of material foothold in the U.S. military. So that's what they're going to go with. So, um, so whatever, FDR is like looking at this magazine. He says, uh, some of the stuff appearing therein comes pretty close to being seditious. And he says, uh, now that we're in a war, it looks like a good chance to clean up a number of these vile publications. So charges get brought against Pelly and a number of his associates in the Silver Shirts, as well as like Fritz Kuhn uh, from the Bund and uh, mm-hmm. under the Sedition Act. Yeah. So luckily, Pelly was told by his spirit friends uh, from the fourth and fifth dimensions that the jury was going to side with him. So he was not worried at all about this trial. <laughs> and um, and the fact is, is, like, he had good reason not to worry. Like, the prosecution's evidence was exclusively this magazine, one issue inside of one soldier's duffel bag. And that was all that they fucking had. That's all they went mm. with. And they brought in, like, a bunch of kind of academic types and, like, uh, scholars and whatever journalists. And, like, they would give these, like, impassioned testimonies describing what Pelly's up to and the significance of different chapters in the Galilean. They would like read through the Galilean mm-hmm. and stuff to the jury. And, um, and like Pelly was like, I mean, I, they can't touch me. So his legal team, <laughs> he, uh, is so confident that he like, I don't know where he finds these fucking people. I guess they were his friends uh, or something, but these people were like barely lawyers that he gets to defend them. They don't attack the prosecution once in this trial. Like what they do is they bring in celebrities like Charles Lindbergh shows up and gives uh-huh. like a, a personal testimony about what Charles Lindbergh himself later said was nothing. He was like, I didn't know why they were asking me these questions. It didn't make any sense to me. They didn't look very prepared. And so, uh, somehow, Oh, and also, <laughs> and also at one point, his own defense calls him to take the witness stand and calls him like, Mr. Hitler, if you'd please take the stand by accident. He calls him Mr. Hitler. So like, 
so against all odds, uh, Pelly loses this battle, and the jury uh, unanimously charges him for uh, sedition here. So, um, oh my God, yeah. They, and also, by the way, the defense's whole line was like, well, he's just a simple country publisher, you know, he's one of those kinds of things. Mm. But uh, Pelly, and he, they were trying to say, like, you know, he's not a political guy, he's a religious guy. That was the whole thing. Pelly takes the stand and just starts to fucking rail about the Jewish conspiracies and the American government <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. Like, did not, you know, there's no order here on the defense. Yeah. Um, um, also, by the way, taking the stand was General George Mosley, who we mm. talked about now a few times. Mm. Uh, so let me finish this up. Okay, so in the end, the jury uh, convicts him on 11 out of 12 counts of treason and sedition, and he gets sentenced to 15 years. The judge back in North Carolina was like super happy about that and like taxed two to three years that the Pelly owed him onto that sentence. And so Pelly, in the end, though, only manages to serve eight years. And... Um, and uh, and he almost got into trouble in 44 with another mass sedition trial against all sorts of like 30 Nazi sympathizers was launched, but mm. uh, the judge died and the whole thing was forgotten. And so, so basically like the tide, the political attention turns towards communism now uh, after the war is over. And um, I guess Pelly manages to work his way out in eight years. And so like, he did, he did eight years then. And... Yeah. Yeah. He just did eight years. So, but um, so this is our final part which I call fourth dimensional Jesus sure do talk funny. So Pelly is paroled in 1950, you know, uh, during this red scare, nobody cares about him anymore. So of course, like the first thing he does is start a cult. Um, he was pulling, he's still like pulling in money from all these publications from back in the day, but the sales like without him writing new material had completely fallen off. And he also wasn't allowed to leave Hamilton, Indiana where, where he was. So he couldn't do any speaking tours or anything like that. And also he's banned from writing politically. That's all part of his, his, um, whatever parole. So, um, right out of the gates, he establishes something called Soulcraft press, which would eventually be incorporated into a nonprofit called Soulcraft fellowship. And so mm-hmm. now North Carolina hasn't forgotten Pelly and they still want that blood for like unserved time. But this Hamilton judge protects Pelly from the North Carolina judge. So now Pelly's feeling super comfortable, right? And he, he's feeling like maybe he can get back into politics a little bit, uh, but he doesn't really get much farther than this. Like he, he still gets these clairaudient messages, of course, mm-hmm, from the mentors mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. who teach him about the United Nations now. So now this is his, his little rant about the United Nations. Pelly argued that the United Nations modeled on the Soviet Union was, quote, kosher manipulated, uh, communist-led attempt to destroy individual freedom. Even worse, the, quote, Stalinist United Nations sought to level out all racial differences. Pelly argued that true internationality involved the maintenance of racial and national groups so that each may fulfill its offices to the other, you know, the obligations that the races have to each other. While Pelly's vision of international relations was currently impossible, given the quote, strategies of non-social races to the uh, peoples of Christendom. Uh, Clairaudient sources tell him that the United Nations would soon collapse in the Middle East, and this is the best prophecy of the whole series of prophecies. So, he predicted, Pelly prophesied, that uh, the Chinese uh, demonstrated a racial strength owing to their Lemurian ancestry, and that made it possible oh, for uh, uh, uh-huh. and that made it possible for the Russians to protect themselves from the inevitable quote oriental invasion. So after taking control of the Soviet Union, which is weakened by its quote racial mongrelization, the Chinese would invade the Middle East, <laughs> occupy Israel and quote finish off the Zionists who would have asked for it or sorry, yeah, who have asked for it. Uh, this conflict, predicted to start in October of 1956, will lead to the creation of two armed camps, the Chinese-led Muslim Asiatic Treaty Organization, that's MATO, for those of you keeping track, oh, okay. and the American-dominated Pan-Aryan Federation. Eventually, MATO would succumb because the forthcoming, Armag- this is a quote, the forthcoming Armageddon is the pitting of the yellow egoist against the white entrepreneur in the earth scene with the white winning out eventually because he possesses greater virtues. So mm. when war didn't break out as predicted, uh, Pelly just started to keep pushing the date back. Sure. So to 59. 
I'm 61, you know, <laughs> like he's just uh-huh. Uh-huh. he doesn't live much longer, so he doesn't have to do it for too long. But he's also uh, he's also still pushing at this time the idea of the great corporation of the United States, um, and he adds that income would be distributed at pre-established levels according to your quote Q status. Uh-huh. Hmm. Interesting. Huh? I want to make a interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So he has followers in the 50s and 60s? Uh, he, his followers in the 50s and 60s are basically the people that didn't die in the 40s. Uh-huh. So he's got like a, a tight crew of increasingly older people um, who slowly die over the decades, basically. Yeah, I mean, some of his uh, followers from the 30s kind of moved on into uh, different directions. This is why I reacted when you mentioned that he used the phrase Aryan Nations. Is because yes. one of the members in the 30s was Richard Butler, That's who correct. La- later become the founder and leader of the most important Christian identity group, which is Aryan Nations. And we'll have yes. a separate episode yeah. about that. But his roots are in the civil shirts. Yeah, so is yeah. Um, this guy, uh, Mike Beach, who founded the uh, Posse Comitatus in 1968 that has mm-hmm. Christian identity okay. links. And, mm-hmm. yeah. and also, uh, I think... Um, was it him that also went on to help found the John Birch Society? There's some John Birch connections to the Silver Shirts. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well. I mean, like a lot of different kind of Nazis and fascists were in the John Birch Society. At you, some point. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we have an episode about that, right? Planned. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So uh, let's finish this up. Just a little bit more cosmic stuff, and then we're done. So um, basically, uh, I'm going to save all his cosmic race science for our uh, kind of X Files episode, but. Um, yeah, we're doing uh, a, a Nazi UFO episode. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, but just I fun. guess in short, uh, basically, white people are all from Sirius, and uh, every fucking race comes from a different star or planet. Of course. All right, so that's basically it. So, soul and also is what apparently he's this. from a different, uh, like, imagined continent, like. Lemuria yes. or Lemuria or Atlantis, yeah. etc. Yeah. Mm. So uh Soulcraft, you know, uh just very clearly like a, a scam. I mean, like it required a lot of expensive books. Local reading groups would have to with would have to have like an official representative there to like help the souls get to the fourth plane of existence, to the like the fifth plane and break the reincarnation cycle and stuff like that. Mm. Uh any Coglin in this time also got new powers. Like he could see through walls. Uh um, Pe- Pelly, I mean. Pelly, sorry, what did I say? Coglin. Oh, sorry. No. Uh yeah, Pelly had had super magic <laughs> powers. So he could he could he could uh he could see through walls. He could like um he couldn't die. <laughs> that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, but Pelly also claimed at the time to be working on something called Univision, which made me laugh. Univision. Oh. Um, w- but which was uh, a system, I assume you could purchase it, of ultraviolet light and piezo quartz lenses that would allow, quote, discarnate soul spirits to be seen on television screens. He also began stressing his ability in both astral projection and the voluntary materialization of his, quote, etheric double Pelly's fascination with invisible bodies peaked with his claim that, quote, violet light photographs have been taken of imbeciles, amnesia victims, and others of impaired mentality, showing their living bodies equipped with two heads. Uh, yeah. Pelly, at this point, was straight up claiming that, <laughs> like, yeah. But get this. All right. He's also claiming that literally nobody on Earth can die. Unless it's part of the original plan on the fourth plane, on the uh, the higher planes, rather. And he claimed also that he himself could not be killed or even seriously wounded because, again, mm-hmm. Nostradamus told him that he was going to live till 1989, right? So um, uh, he would say, like, you know, I, I can cut myself and I won't bleed out. Uh, I've crashed a plane into the ground and blah, blah, blah. And he, like, he was just Im- he was immortal until Nostradamus uh said it was over so Mm. basically one of his philosophies is this and his later philosophy is basically that who you are was predetermined before your birth by your original soul spirit who decided now to leave the fourth dimension and return to the earth plane and so if you if you were in like for instance an abusive relationship don't worry you chose it right Uh like he specifically Uh singles things like that out if you were born into like a position of child labor well that's just because your soul decided it wanted a fun experience to see you know Mm -hmm. how well it could do this time around so um yeah 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 so uh and he also yeah yeah okay um 
This is, yeah, he writes, yeah. You simply can't kill a person whose time hasn't yet come to go. Though you club him over their pate, shove them off of a tall building, or crush them beneath hurtling motor cars, they simply won't kill, he writes. <laughs> and so Christ's people are the militant ones who have made their cosmic plans, right, in their past life. The ones, the responsible soul spirits that before being alive made the plan. These are Christ's men. Uh, they're going to be safe no matter what, while others are just going to be slaughtered by the millions. If you are one of Christ's men, listen to this. You are immune as an Eskimo is immune from freezing to death in Arctic cold, or as a savage is immune from sunstroke in the tropical jungle. Eskimos immune from cold. The igloo stuff is just for fun, just for shits and giggles. Um, don't need no shelter. They got that But it's power. cold in there, right? It's made out of ice. Made out of ice. How they survive. Uh, so finally, yeah, I, I think he was probably surprised that he ended up, you know, eating it in 1965, well before his expiration <laughs> date. And um, also, like, before he managed to, to die, you could still buy his special dialogues now. Of, and by the way, please, if anybody has any recordings of Pelly's voice, please, please send them to us. There's very little of his voice online, and I would love to hear him talk about this. So you could get, at the time, uh, for about what would be about 100 bucks today, his special dialogues with Nostradamus and, quote, other great Atlantean luminaries. Uh, and, of course, Jesus Christ himself in a book that was called As Thou Lovest in which Christ speaking to Pelly tells him that Jesus had an invisible playmate from another planet, that he was forced to become a Jew against his will and was placed on this planet in the first place to quote, destroy the scourge of Jews. Uh, that's Jesus. So the book also became uh, kind of like, as it goes on, the book becomes an adventure novel with like exciting mm. lines, like Nicodemus speaking to Christ and saying this, Marco, the cheese buyer, beheld you with companions in the street called Straight today. That's an example. Wait, that's like actually from the book? dialogue. That's a quote from the book. <laughs> yeah. So, and when Jesus talks, of course, you get the. Uh, Did I not declare unto the times which I came? Ye do pass on the planes of thought in your consciousness, when behold cometh flesh again. And that's, you know, that's his Jesus. So, uh, right. yeah. And Jesus, by the way, always signs his um, prophecies with peace. That's it. Oh. Yeah. So uh, that's it, man. Nice. That's the, uh, another fraudster that started a mass Nazi movement in the U.S., yeah, that's I mean, a particularly weird one, though I gotta say. Yeah, yeah, yeah t- t- I, I mean, mean we thing- kind of yeah we talked about weirder people than him, but he's a, he's a pioneer of Nazi weirdness. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like uh, could not mm. stop thinking about many people from our from our first arc actually. Mm. This guy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's but kind of um, kind of overlooked, I would say. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, after reading about him and this whole thing. I'm kind of glad he's overlooked now. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, I wish never these people That's, never existed. Any of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. wonder if we've opened a Pandora's box here, and yeah. now he's going to be a big thing again. Well, the thing is, is actually Hearts of Iron Four seem to do that a little bit. Like, uh, yeah. there's a lot of YouTube videos of people trying to do like the Pelly playthrough and shit like that. And mm. uh, yeah, so I think th- does he appear? I didn't watch the show, but the, the like the the man in the high castle show which i haven't watched it either uh i'm I, trying to think i i don't remember any references to pelly specifically mm-hmm. there are references to fritz kuhn i think there are references to rockwell is a character uh, rockwell is yeah. a character yeah yeah um but i can't think it's been a little while since i watched it yeah i mean i love the book i didn't like the show so much so i didn't watch it i, I like the show i mean it's mm-hmm. different um but i found it entertaining yeah so that's another nazi down more Nazis mm-hmm. to go. Yeah. To add to our uh, terrible baseball card collection here. And we're not even like, we're not even trying at this point to cover weed Nazis. The Nazis are just weird. I mean, uh, yeah, we don't have to do a lot yeah. of work here. I yeah. mean, <laughs> it's mm. not saying that reading Pelly isn't work, it's fucking work. Become yeah. a patron. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I have to say, I, I had a lot more fun reading this than Siege. I will say that. This was well, a lot more interesting. Pelly well, has Siege, movies. Siege is frustrating and just yeah. way too fucking long. It's repetitive stuff, and too long. I mean, there's yeah. really no need for that book to exist. Yeah, that's true of a lot of Pelly's books too. But I mean, he really just fucking went for it. You know, he had mm. he had like hustles coming out of every fucking angle. He 
had new prophecies all the time. I mean, it was it was a it was yeah. a fun it was a fun time. Me and Pelly. Yeah, I'm gonna miss I'm, him. Yeah, he's a uh, yeah, and a very kind of direct overlap between New Age stuff and fascism in him. Absolutely. Yeah, and which you he, have uh, a lot of that, but he's he's really kind of boating at once in a very uh, big way. He's like a, well, a new agey leader and a Nazi leader. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, hand in glove. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, we'll talk about this again in that in that much of Ballyhood X Files up, but um, we uh, he also is responsible for the pyramids coming from aliens um, mm. or having a connection oh, yeah. to aliens anyway. Pyramids thing. are a big uh-huh, thing yeah. in many many things. Uh, they're they're yes. also uh, he studied pyramidism. Very, yeah, yeah. Uh, it has a very uh, pyramids have a very important role in the British Israelism uh, thing yeah. as well. Oh. The Bosnian pyramids, of course, of we course. mustn't forget. Yeah. Uh, which I wonder if actually the Bosnian pyramids have some connection to this. Is the guy Samir Osmanagic who discovered them lived most of his life in the U.S. or you know a large portion of his life in Texas? Yeah, um, Texas also didn't really back the Silver Shirts that much. Weird, it didn't really. Uh, they didn't have a huge presence there. They had a presence there, but it was pretty mm-hmm. small. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean yeah. they're not the only ones. You know, I mean like right wing groups fucking love aliens and <laughs> talking to yeah. Jeebus and all that. So. And this is now the the second group in our, our podcast that has uh, the letter L as their symbol. That oh, that's covered. right. No, that's right. yeah, because they're the Mas- uh, Montenegrin nationalists too. Yes, uh, nice. it stands for what? Liberal? Yes, liberal. Yes. yes, that's amazing to me. That's the funniest one. Maybe it yeah. stands for Lemurian. Maybe. Ooh. Um, Ooh. <laughs> maybe it's a warning about the Lemurian invasion. Hmm. Montenegrins are Lemurians. There you uh, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which makes them. Also Chinese? No, Pelly was wrong. It's not the Chinese. It's Montenegro. It's uh, six hundred thousand oh, people going okay, to okay. conquer. Uh, <laughs> All right, guys. Well, stay tuned for our next step. Who the Lemurians really were with <laughs> Boris? <Yes. laughs> See you later. <laughs> All right. Ciao. 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 Later. Ciao.